Good morning, everyone. Sean, do you want to begin by introducing the panel for us? Sure thing. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sean Welsh. I'm the Interim Vice President for University Marketing and Communications, and I'll serve as our moderator for this morning's town hall. I do want to introduce all of our panelists for um, the attendees we have here this morning. We have President Kim Schatzel. We have Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, Melanie Perot. We have our Vice President for Admin and Finance and our CFO, Ben Lowenthal. We have our Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Vernon Hurt. And we have our Associate Vice President for Human Resources and our Chief Human Resources Officer, Steve Jones. I also wanna thank our ASL interpreter for this morning, Barb Menges for joining us. And uh, I'm gonna hand things over now to President Schatzel to uh, provide some opening remarks. I do want to let everyone know, however, to ask questions uh, for the town hall this morning. Please use the Q&A function on your screen and I'll give some additional directions after opening remarks from President Schatzel. Thank you, Sean. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're headed into the, uh, the end of the semester. Um, we wanted to be able to have a town hall with everyone uh, to be able to answer questions that have arisen, as well as with regard to the vaccine, as well as uh, what we're going to be looking at towards the fall. Uh, but before we go to the questions and before we start um, having the town hall in that forum, I just want to thank everyone once again for everything that they've done to support our students and each other during this year. Um, it's been a challenge, but I think we're seeing uh, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, particularly with the levels of vaccinations that are being provided across the state and across the nation. And I can tell you that I've been inundated with emails of gratitude uh, and, and excitement from our graduates from 2020 and 2021 and their families. They are so excited to be able to have a commencement on campus. There'll be 10 of them over a five day period of time, uh, but we're just thrilled in the fact that we can celebrate with our graduates and their families. This is such an important milestone for them and, and to bring a sense of normalcy to return to the campus with that. I wanna thank everybody who's volunteered to be able to support those 10 commencements. We need each and every one of you because we're doing so many more than as usual uh, but we wanted to support both graduation years uh, to be able to celebrate them. So again, thank you very much. And Sean, we can go right to questions. All right, very good. Uh, for those who have not entered questions in a town hall format at the university before, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen to submit questions for our panelists. For any questions we do not get to today or for any questions that you need to answer um, for after this event, uh, after the event closes or after um, we have wrapped things up this morning, uh, feel free to email asktu at towson.edu and we'll get back to you as soon as we can there. Again, that's asktu at towson.edu. Uh, I also want to provide an additional note that last night we held a commencement town hall for our graduating students and families in advance of those uh, in-person commencement celebrations scheduled for later this month at United Stadium. A recording of that town hall will be made available at towson.edu later this week. Um, I also wanna make note that this town hall will be provided in its full uh, video format on the university's website later this week as well. And for all information on the uh, university's response to the co uh, coronavirus pandemic and more information, visit towson.edu slash coronavirus. Uh, so we'll now open things up to questions. And again, to submit them, use the Q&A function on your screen. Um, First one coming in here, uh, will Sentinel testing be required in the fall? Uh, we'll pass that one to um, Vice President Hurt to answer. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so yes, we will continue. Uh, we are anticipating a return testing for all of our campus. Uh, we anticipate having Sentinel testing uh, continue. Um, we will note that um, at this point, based on uh, the science and kind of where CDC guidance is, uh, for, for those who are fully vaccinated, um, we don't anticipate that uh, they will be included in the Sentinel testing, but we will have uh, a Sentinel testing program in the fall. Thank you. Have some questions coming in in regards to um, the USM mandate um, about the vaccination for COVID-19 um, and how that mandate came about and, and 
the uh, the logistics behind it. And I'll go to President Schassel to begin answering that question. If you could provide some additional clarity around the vaccine and and how we can mandate a vaccine. I, I'm sure I'll be able to take that. That's probably the big question that everybody might have at this point in time, because it was recently announced uh, that the, we were going to mandate uh, vaccines for faculty, students, and staff. Uh, the decision was made by Chancellor Perman uh, with the Board of Regents to be able to have that mandate. And it's not just for Towson University, it is for all the 12 institutions, as well as three regional centers within the USM. Uh, so that requirement is in place to be able to do that. Um, I can share with you the fact that, you know, one of the two quotes that I'll share from the chancellor, he said when he made that announcement that I believe the vaccine is necessary, especially on college campuses, and that widespread vaccination is how we will have a fall semester that resembles a pre-pandemic normal. Uh, and we all know how important that is for our campuses to return to that pre-pandemic normal and to be able to support a, a full campus experience for our students, as well as to have our faculty return to their research and their instruction and to bring our staff back as well, to be able to have this be the kind of campus that we want it to be. Um, I can share with you the fact that uh, this was not taken lightly. Uh, there was a committee put together. There was conferring with all of the university presidents. We were in full support of it. Uh, there was conversations with shared governance at this campus as well as across the other USMs. Uh, so the decision was made to be able to have that as a requirement. I, I can tell you the fact that we're not alone. Uh, there's 209 universities across the United States that have announced requirements for vaccines for this fall and included among them, as I said, are the USM uh, universities but it's also Johns Hopkins, it's also Morgan State University, um, there's George Washington, uh, American, and Georgetown. So if you just look at the Maryland location and DC location, you can see the fact that uh, we're not leading edge on that. We're not pioneering it. It's a requirement that you're seeing that many, many universities nationwide are, are, are making moves to be able to acquire. Um, we're very fortunate. Maryland and the fact that uh, as of yesterday, our positivity rate was 2.8% uh, attributed to the vaccines and the amount of vaccines that have been distributed within this state. 62% of eligible Marylanders are now have at least one vaccination. Uh, we all remember back to the January, February time period where you know we were just trying to get a vaccine. Well, now we've got walk-in clinics throughout the state so people can have access to the vaccine and distribution is not an issue. Um, we're also looking at the fact that on our campus, our positivity rate is currently right now 0.6% and uh, was no higher on an average from the beginning of the year was 0.8. Um, so the tide has turned and for us to have a safe and healthy campus um, with the support of the presidents uh, and with the support of the board, Chancellor um, Perman made that decision and we're fully in support of it. So we really want to encourage everyone, if you've not received the vaccine, please go and get it. Uh, please go uh, be able to um, contribute to the fact that we will have a safe and healthy campus this fall. As uh, Dr. Hurt said, there'll be changes associated with that. For example, the fact that we don't anticipate those that are vaccinated are going to be required in sentinel testing. So there'll be changes as we go about. We're actually next week going to have the directional signs removed from campus. Um, masking outside is not going to be required. So as we have these types of changes, of course, always looking at state and local guidelines as well as CDC, we're going to be able to see the fact that there will be shifts uh, because of the level of vaccination that's going on in our state as well as on our campus. Um, so, you know, I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't already gotten the vaccine, and I already have, uh, to be able to take a look at making that um, part of what you're going to make a priority for yourself. Thank you. Uh, we have some additional questions coming in about, you know, uh, how we can mandate this vaccination. And uh, one of them um, makes note that the university does not mandate vaccines. Um, so uh, I want to provide a moment of, of some correction there. The university does require vaccinations and immunizations for students. Um, Dr. Hurt, could you address that concern uh, for our audience here today too? Sure, Sean, yes. 
Uh, so this is not new for students. Um, we do currently require uh, the MMR vaccine for students as well as the, uh, the Tdap. Uh, for students. Uh, for students who are residential, uh, we also require the meningitis um, uh, vaccine. And so uh, this isn't new for, for our students. Uh, this uh, COVID-19 vaccine is just uh, an added uh, vaccine requirement to our current uh, vaccination requirements. And if I could add, Sean, you know, I, uh, this is new news that's just happened in the last few months. And we've seen that there's been a lot of questions around um, medical issues as well as religious uh, issues with regard to the vaccine. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to be able to say is the fact that, you know, we, we completely recognize that there's individuals that have concerns either because of religious or medical reasons. Um, for, for those that are uh, medical questions that people might have, um, you know, I strongly encourage you to be able to talk to your physician to be able to get the kind of information that you might need to be able to um, consider that. Um, we will have uh, medical and religious exemptions uh, that will be considered. Um, and Steve, would you like to just add when that portal will be up and how we'll go about doing that? Sure, thank you, President Schatzel. As the president mentioned, uh, we will be communicating uh, probably within the next two weeks, uh, specific uh, forms for individuals who would like to uh, request an exemption for medical reasons or for religious reasons. And again, uh, those, those forms will go into a single portal. Uh, the portal will be set up and we will communicate that. And then once the, uh, once the requests have been received, uh, faculty and staff requests will be reviewed by the Office of Human Resources. And uh, the student requests will be reviewed by the Office of Student Affairs in conjunction with uh, uh, our, 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 our health um, center, our, our student health center uh, here on campus, University Health uh, for the medical side. So again, uh, if in fact you've got a concern, you believe that there's, there's a medical situation or religious situation that you'd like to request an exemption, we would encourage you uh, to take advantage of, of applying for that uh, through, the, uh, through the portal with the forms that are, those should be out within the next two weeks. Thank you both for your answers there. Um, there was one uh, remark that the president made in regards to um, some of the directional signage on campus and those things coming down. Um, so I'll go to Vice President Lowenthal to provide an update in regards to directional signage and um, entryways on campus. Thank you, John. So the directional signs are coming down. And that is provided the, uh, by the advice of our TU Medical Advisory Committee in that the directional signs can come down. Of course, we still have all the other requirements and signs in place. So we're still going to be doing the masking, the distancing and everything else, including sentiment testing. So the only thing that's really changing is the directional signs that are in the buildings, uh, mostly in the hallways pointing in one direction or the other. In addition, the, the signs in different rooms with capacities will continue as well. So we wanna make sure to keep the community safe. But again, those directional signs are coming down based on the advice of our TU Medical Advisory Committee. Thank you. Uh, some follow-up questions in in regards to the vaccine and who is uh, who falls under mandate or requirement amongst our campus community, um, specifically in regards to visitors on campus. So I'll go to AVP Jones to provide some additional details, if possible, in regards to who the mandate covers uh, on our campus community. Yeah, thanks, Sean. That, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the, the intent, obviously, is for those who regularly come to campus. That would be those you know, students, faculty, um, uh, our, our outside uh, vendors, uh, staff that are either living, regularly working on campus, uh, that are attending uh, specific events uh, uh, on a regular basis, using our facilities. Uh, also individuals, um, you know, who, who, who would be taking a class, uh, holding a class on campus. Uh, the intent is not for the, uh, the individual visitor coming to campus, the guests coming to campus. We have campus uh, tours and visits that'll be going on that won't be required of those individuals. But really, the focus is on those who are coming regularly to campus. And uh, in our communication that we've sent out, we, we, we've defined and specified who those individuals are. And I would encourage, if there's a question, uh, to, to look at that. And uh, if you have a question specifically about a, a particular individual, particular situation, uh, to, to you know, ask your supervisor or ask your manager uh, so we can get clarity around any question that there might be about any, any particular individual. But I will say that on our vendor side, and uh, uh, Vice President Lowenthal can, can uh, reinforce this, that we've set an expectation that our vendors meet the same standard that we have for our faculty, staff, and our students. 
Yes, and thank you, Steve. We, we are in communication with all our major vendors and they understand that they are required to meet the same requirements that we require of the entire campus. So their staff will also be getting vaccinated as mandated. Thank you both. You answered the follow-up question that came in in regards to um, our vendors. So I appreciate that. Um, a question I'll pass now to Provost Perot in regards to uh, classrooms. Um, will we still have the six foot distancing in place or is the university looking at moving to three feet physical distancing? So, so we anticipate there'll be a change uh, as people get vaccinated and the CDC looks at that and is continuing to monitor um, how vaccines impact the ability to, uh, to spread. So uh, we're expecting to be higher density than we were in, this semester in the classrooms, in the labs, in the performance halls, all over campus. Thank you. Uh, there's an additional question in, uh, from, in from some faculty members in regards to the mask mandate and in inside classrooms in particular. Even if our students are vaccinated, are we going to continue the mask mandate in class classroom spaces into the fall? So that that again, we'll we'll have to see as we get to the fall, and as you know, I think we've we've seen that CDC advice is continually changing as they're getting more and more information and based on. Uh, their research. And so we'll continue to follow that and we'll, we'll see where it goes. So uh, right now, as people know, we've changed the mask mandate for outdoors. So you can now walk outdoors on campus without the mask. However, in large event spaces, including United Stadium, you still do have to wear the mask. And so it's evolving over time as the science changes and we'll uh, keep watching it and, and we'll uh, give people the advice as it gets closer. We have a question in as well that I'll pass to you, Provost Perot, uh, in regards to our uh, enrollment admission numbers looking for fall. Um, how are we uh, How are we looking right now in terms of uh, incoming freshmen and transfer students for the fall term? So we we are plugging away on those numbers. Um, we are we are getting close to what our target was. I'm happy to say, uh, for our incoming freshmen uh, and incoming transfer students, uh, we still you know it's. We have work to do, but we're feeling pretty good about the uh, the recent numbers. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions in in regards to how to show proof of vaccination. Um, some have referenced the CRISP waiver. Um, is there another way beyond the CRISP waiver uh, to have your vaccine verified uh, to show that show proof of vaccination? Um, I'll go to AVP Jones to begin answering this question, and if others have additional details to weigh in, uh, please feel free. Thanks, Sean. I may have to tag team with uh, Dr. Hurd on this one, uh, but we, we have a portal that is uh, close to going live any day now that uh, will we'll provide individuals the opportunity to submit uh, proof of vaccination. And I know that uh, we're working very closely with the University Health Center uh, to make sure that we can keep track of both faculty, staff, and student uh, vaccinations. And uh, Dr. Hurd, if you'd like to expound on that. Sure, sure. So uh, again, we'll have a, a submission form that will be available. There'll be more communication coming out uh, with the details on how to uh, submit that. Uh, I do want to note that for the other required vaccines, there is a separate form. Uh, the information is already, already available on the University Health Center uh, website. So we'd encourage uh, our students and families in particular, but uh, for our faculty and staff, uh, to be aware of that, that information is uh, available. So uh, we'll have a uh, COVID-19 vaccine uh, process, uh, but for the other required vaccines, uh, just a reminder that there is a uh, current uh, form that's separate uh, that's required for that. Another question I'll pass to you, um, Vice President Hurt. Uh, will the university's health center eventually have the vaccine to distribute to faculty, staff, and students? Yeah, another great question. Uh, so we are currently approved to be a, a vaccination site. Um, of course, um, you know, it gets down to availability of vaccines. Uh, and so uh, if the uh, vaccine is available uh, for us to be able to provide on campus, we, we are prepared and approved to be able to offer that. Thank you. I have a couple questions in in regards to uh, Governor Hogan's announcement earlier this week in regards to the uh, $100 incentive for state employees being vaccinated. Um, does that apply to USM employees as well? Uh, I'll go to President Chassel to answer that one. 
Thank you, Sean. Um, this was just announced just this week, so the information was new to us to be able to, to take a look at. Um, as it stands right now, as, as far as I understand and we're in contact with the USM, it does not apply to Towson, to USM uh, employees, which would be include Towson, as well as Morgan State University. Um, and the logic I think that was provided was the fact that we had mandated the vaccinations. I have a great deal of respect for Governor Hogan, as I know the chancellor does. And um, we're having conversations with them about that uh, and the rationale for having us excluded. Um, I can assure you the fact that uh, we, we don't want that to be the case uh, and we're having those conversations. Uh, so I'm hopeful the fact that we can be able to either um, uh, effectively persuade the fact that we would be included or take a look at whether the USM or Towson would be able to provide the same type of incentive and reward to our employees to be able to, to go out and do that. So if you're thinking of getting a vaccine and you're waiting for the incentive, please don't, please don't do that. Uh, I can assure you that if that takes place, those that are going to be vaccinated, or those that have been, we're going to treat everybody the same because we're most appreciative of the fact that people are moving uh, towards getting those vaccines themselves to keep the community safe. Thank you. Um, a question in, in regards to the modality of instruction delivery this fall from, um, I'm going to assume a faculty member here. What type of instruction will be required in the fall? If we are teaching on campus, will we also be required to provide online instruction simultaneously? I'll go to Provost Perot to provide some details in regards to the modality this fall. So we are expecting the vast majority of our courses to be face-to-face -face in the fall. So. Right now, 93% of our undergraduate courses are scheduled face-to-face. -face. And so, um, so we look forward to having that full return. We will not require faculty to teach simultaneously online and face-to-face, -face, as we know that that presented significant challenges for many faculty. Um, if a faculty member so chooses to do so, they are welcome to do so, but it will not be required. Thank you. Um, how about visitors on campus this fall? Uh, will visitors be allowed for art exhibitions, workshops, performances? And if so, will they be required uh, to show proof of vaccination as well? Go to um, Vice President Hurt to begin answering this one. Sure. Uh, thanks, Sean. So uh, actually, we, we've already begun uh, to have uh, visitors on campus. Um, and so we will have uh, allowed visitors on campus in the fall. Uh, visitors uh, don't fall into kind of the category of those who are regularly on campus, uh, so won't be required to um, have the vaccine. Thank you. Uh, I have one question in, it's a, 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 just a touch off of the COVID trail, but talking about um, new facilities going in, somebody has referenced the College of Health Professions, they've seen it in the news coverage um, and the announcement from the university within the last couple of days. Um, I'm gonna to go to Vice President Lowenthal on this one. Could you provide some updates around the College of Health Professions when the ground was going to be broken on that facility and where on campus it might be going? Thank you, Sean. We're very excited that we have that College of Health Professions fully funded. We have $50 million coming to us in this coming fiscal year, as well as pre-authorization for the remainder of the funding, about a total of $173 million over the next three fiscal years. The ground is going to be broken on June 7th, that is this year, this year. so really just uh, about a month away. And it will be going basically in the area where a Dow Health building is, um, where there's an awesome empty block there next to it. And so essentially it's on the uh, northeast side of campus in that area. We're very excited. Thank you. Um, another question in regards to masks indoors, um, I will go to uh, Provost Perot to provide an update here. Will masking be required inside once everyone is vaccinated? So uh, once again, I, I just have to defer to what the CDC recommendations will be. Um, right now in small groups, if everybody's vaccinated, the CDC is saying you can remove your mask, but you know, what that number might be in the fall. I don't want to speculate, but we'll, we'll follow it. Um, I will say that I've spent many days, full days wearing a mask and speaking and you get used to it very, very quickly. And so I, we'll see what the CDC recommends and we'll follow that advice. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll keep you talking here, Provost Perot. Uh, where, where do we expect the classroom capacities to be for the fall? So again, I expect there'll be greater density uh, based on the, the fact that everybody will be vaccinated. The vast majority will be vaccinated. And so um, again, as that recommendation comes in, we, we will adjust, but we are anticipating uh, significantly increased density. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions in from faculty and staff who are working on figuring out their childcare situations for the summer. Um, are we going to have any on-campus um, camps that are being held uh, this summer? I'll go to Vice President Hurt to provide some updates in regards to camps on campus. Yes, so um, yeah, ECS, I really wanna uh, thank that team who has been uh, working hard over the last few weeks uh, in preparation for our commencements and uh, preparing to welcome uh, day camps this summer and, and programs. And so we do have uh, some programs who are uh, slated or uh, we're anticipating uh, will be hosted on campus. And so I would encourage you to just look out for uh, more information uh, and communication, uh, both through campus, but also uh, within the communities about uh, any programs that will be hosted here uh, at Towson University this summer. Thank you. Um, another question in, in regards to facilities around campus, will the plastic shields that have gone up around campus during the pandemic be removed along with the directional signage? Uh, Vice President Lowenthal, could you provide an update in regards to the plastic that is up um, at different touch points across campus? Sure, at this point in time, we're gonna keep those plastic shields in place. The only thing we're removing is the directional signage. So again, plastic shields, the room capacities, all of that is going to stay. And of course, we'll continue to monitor CDC and state guidelines. And if there are any changes at any point in time, we'd be in touch with campus. But for right now, the plastic fields and the room capacities are, are staying in place. Thank you. Uh, I have a question in, in regards to CRISP, uh, the system that we've made some reference to here uh, so far today. Um, and I'll go to Vice President uh, Hurt on this one. Um, can, can we provide some additional clarity in regards to what CRISP is providing to the university as far as information? Does it give additional access to other medical records or simply um, sharing the information in regards to the vaccine? Sure. So it, it is limited to um, the release. Uh, so the release uh, notes uh, two uh, specific uh, items, uh, your COVID-19 uh, test results, um, as well as the COVID-19 vaccine. And so uh, any information that is shared through CRISP uh, is limited to those items uh, and the items that you uh, note in your release. Thank you. Uh, we're about the halfway point now of our hour we have here this morning. I do wanna remind folks who may have just joined that uh, to ask questions, please use the uh, Q&A function on your Zoom screen. We do have uh, a number of questions I'm going to try to get through here in the, the next half of our town hall. Uh, for any anybody who joined and maybe missed the first half and, and have asked questions that uh, maybe we haven't asked here in the last few moments, uh, I will encourage you to check back in at the university website for the first half of this. A recording of this will be provided later this week. Um, we do have a couple questions in in regards to the uh, USM's mandate on vaccinations. Um, specifically in reference to the emergency youth use authorization uh, for the vaccination um, and uh, whether or not that is something uh, that was taken into consideration. Certainly, uh, we can't speak on behalf of the entire university system here, but uh, President Schatzel, if I could go to you in regards to where we are right now with the authorization of the vaccine and the decision that was made. As I shared, the, um, the decision that was made that we supported, uh, or I supported that the chancellor made, had full consideration of the, of the vaccine, the vaccine safety. Um, you know, we're, as I said, we're looking at 209 universities nationwide are requiring it. We're looking at the fact that 62% of eligible Marylanders, including myself, have received the vaccine. Um, and, and we're looking at the fact that those numbers are gonna be able to increase. Um, again, you know, I'd encourage everybody if, if you have questions around the vaccine or, or, you, or your use of the vaccine, please confer with your own uh, physician uh, to be able to have any particular questions that you might have answered. Thank you. Um, this question we answered earlier, but I do think it's important to, uh, to pull it out. I, think, I don't think we actually answered the question. It was part of somebody else's remarks. Uh, will the university follow CDC recommendations on mask use outdoors? 
Um, I do believe we've made some updates to the mask policy. I'll go to um, Provost Perot to provide some updates in regards to masks outdoors on campus. Yes, again, uh, the CDC just recently changed their advice on that and said you do not have to wear a mask when you are outdoors in, in small groups. And so we have changed that. It's changed on our uh, website and you'll see the signage around campus changing to reflect that. The caveat is that the CDC still recommends that in large gatherings, such as commencement, uh, you still ha have to wear a mask. And so whether you're going to an O's game or you're going to our commencement, uh, bring your mask. Thank you. Um, did the university seek um, input from faculty and staff in regards to the return uh, to campus this summer? Um, that is for those faculty and staff members who have been working um, under the emergency telework update. Uh, so I'll go to AVP Jones to provide some updates in regards to um, the input from faculty and staff for the return to campus. Yeah, John, thanks for the question. Uh, we, we've, we've really tried to keep our shared governance groups uh, you know, it, it close and giving us input. Uh, in fact, they participate in a meeting uh, once a week now with the uh, COVID response leadership team. Uh, so they can provide input and, and observation and ask questions uh, as we go through this, this process of returning to campus. I think it's really important for, for all of us to remember that we all have the same goal. Uh, we're trying to come back to campus to provide our students with the, uh, the on-campus experience that we know is very, very valuable uh, to them individually and for us uh, collectively as faculty and staff to provide that environment uh, that our students thrive, uh, thrive in and uh, navigating all of the uh, challenges that are unique uh, that no one's ever been through with, uh, with a pandemic before. So uh, I guess the, the short answer is yes, we've, we've really tried uh, very, very hard to make sure that uh, we, we uh, stay in touch with our shared governance groups. That includes the SGA, as well as our academic Senate, as well as our staff Senate. Thank you. Um, and a follow-up uh, on the, the telework piece uh, from a number of folks in the, uh, the chat here is, is, is there going to be consideration to additional opportunities for telework going forward um, after the return in July? I'll go back to you, AVP Jones, for that one. Yeah, no, another great question. Uh, we've had obviously a number of questions around our, our telework approach or our telework policy. And you remember you know, a year ago, a little over a year ago, we, we implemented a, uh, a special emergency telework policy that was specific to the pandemic uh, because of the, the, the situation where we had to, you know, for the most part, clear the campus. And uh, that, that policy uh, will sunset on July 6th and we'll revert back to the policy, the telework policy that we had in place. And what we're committed to doing is when we when we get back, uh, you know, post uh, July 6th, is to have a review of our telework policy to to see what we learned over the past year in terms of you know what what about the telework situation? Uh, do we need to to look at maybe uh, making consideration for uh, uh, either making a change or looking at how we might be able to better better accommodate uh, situations that you know, that, that worked. We have situations maybe that didn't work. Uh, and at the same time, we've got to balance that with, uh, you know, there, there was a, a recent uh, uh, piece of legislation that passed and we're trying to make sure that we're compliant there also. But I think the point here is, is that we want to do a comprehensive review of, of, of what happened over the past year. And uh, we'll do that in conjunction with our shared governance groups. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure to, to have input and, and uh, feedback uh, as we go through that process. And, and it's really important, I think, to point out that when we when we reverted to what we did back a year ago, it really wasn't true telework as much as it was we sent everyone you know, away from campus and asked people to do what work they could do uh, while they weren't on campus. And we tried to be as, as flexible and accommodating as we could be. Our telework policy, and, and hopefully folks have, have, have had an opportunity to go back and look at it, uh, it has conditions and parameters that, that are in, in it. Uh, that that you know that that makes sense. And when we go forward, uh, you know, obviously we we want to continue to to have a framework of, of telework whereby you know, you know certain positions are obviously you know maybe potentially uh, much more amenable. Certain positions are not, and it's it's really difficult to say that uh, you know it's it's going to affect you know everybody and anybody at, at one point. So that's really the purpose for us. Uh, to, to, to maybe take a look at it a little bit more comprehensively uh, than to do it pre-return uh, to campus. 
Thank you for that that deep explanation there. Appreciate it. Um, so some questions in. Uh, somebody has referenced the Rise campaign launch from last week. Um, is there a new Office of Student Wellness? I saw it as part of the Rise campaign announcement. Uh, that impacts my department, but I'd be curious to learn some more. Could you tell me more about the Office of Student Wellness? I'll go to uh, Vice President Hurt to provide some additional details there. Thanks, Sean. So we're, we're all really excited about the Rise campaign as we uh, think about really the future of Towson University. Uh, I can share if you've looked at uh, the TU strategic plan uh, and certainly uh, part of my vision uh, as the Vice President for Student Affairs, um, I want Towson University to be uh, a real leader when it comes to supporting the holistic health and wellness uh, of, our, of our students. And so uh, as we move into the future, uh, you'll see more investments and really more focus on expanding um, our focus there, really uh, leveraging uh, the strength that we have in our uh, current departments are uh, really thinking about uh, where we go in the future. And so we don't currently have uh, Office of Student Wellness, but uh, it certainly is the goal to expand our focus on student health and wellness as we go forward. Thank you. Um, a comment and then a question here in, in regards to parking. Thank you for the free parking uh, through the summer. Could you please clarify um, some of the, the timelines? What period is free? Um, and for those who are uh, not interested in purchasing a permit um, before August, uh, what are the steps there? So some additional clarity being asked for in regards to uh, to parking for the summertime, specifically around that period of time in August, um, which we've made for free, um, but may also be covered under an upcoming permit. I'll go to Vice President Lowenthal uh, in regards to parking. Thank you, John, and thank you to the commenter. I appreciate that. The parking is free from May through August. So that is to enable everyone to return to campus and make it a little easier on everyone. That said, we will require permits beginning August 1st, and that is so that we can get the campus into a place where everyone knows that they park in certain areas and not in others. So for those who are purchasing permits for the fall, you will have a permit from August 1st through the end of the fall, but will not be charged for the month of August. And those permit sales will start in late July. For those who may not need to purchase a parking permit for the fall, there will be three one month or one week combination thereof permits available during the month of August, which you will be able to get both at the mobile parking stations around campus as well as online in the parking services website. So if that's a problem, that's the way to uh, resolve that. So at the end of the day, parking will be free for everyone from May through August. Again, those who are parking in the fall, I encourage you to get your permits late July so that you have them beginning August 1st. Hopefully that clarifies. Thank you. Um, some questions uh, we've answered earlier, but uh, I do wanna provide um, some additional clarity here for the, the number of folks who have asked the follow-up. Are vaccine cards sufficient documentation of vaccination? Uh, I'm not even sure that my doctor has a record of my vaccine. Uh, will a vaccine card that somebody has at home uh, be sufficient for proof of vaccination. Um, I'll go to Vice President Hurt on this one. Yeah, so that will that is a um, uh, uh, documentation that will be allowed uh, to to show proof of your vaccine. Um, if you look at the uh, your your card, uh, there's uh, specific information there uh, about the actual dose. Uh, that you received. And so that allows us to be able to uh, have verification uh, through our, our health center. And so that is a sufficient documentation for your vaccine requirement. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to Vice President Lowenthal with an additional question about our facilities. Um, what type of cleaning is taking place across campus? And could you provide some additional details in regards to uh, the level of ventilation in offices for those folks who have not been on campus for the last year? Yes, I can. Thank you, John. So as far as cleaning, we're going to continue that additional cleaning in all the high touch areas. So those areas will be continued to be cleaned multiple times per day by our very capable ADM staff. In terms of the ventilation in the buildings, we have ventilation such that the air is circulated at 100% on at least a daily basis. It's going to vary building to building. We have to take other considerations in terms of health into, into consideration as we set those 
air cycling percentages, but at the end of the day, every building will be at least 100% recycled air uh, on a daily basis. Keep the community safe. I'll go back to you one more time, Vice President Lowenthal, on a follow-up on parking. Um, where does the university stand with its comprehensive review of parking and the surveys that were taking place in the last year? We are right at the point where we're going to make some recommendations. We've gotten recommendations from Tim Lee Horn, who's third party who conducted that parking and transportation study. We are working with the fair governance groups to share some of those recommendations. And as soon as we vetted some of those ideas, we're going to reach out to the rest of the community and share the results of that parking study. Uh, just a, a little bit of a preview, I can tell you that some of those recommendations will be put in place for the fall. Some of them will probably be the following fall because they, there needs to be more ramp up time to make sure that everything that's being recommended can be put in place. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in, in regards to commencement. And I do want to take a moment to remind everybody um, the, um, that we held a town hall for all of our graduates and their families uh, last evening. That information will be available at the commencement page on the university website as well. There are plenty of FAQs there now that may address some of your questions and concerns, but uh, in particular, are individuals allowed to request additional tickets for commencement and are masks being required at commencement? I will go to Provost Perot for this one. So uh, students, each graduate has uh, the opportunity to have four tickets and there are no extras. So we will not be doing a second redistribution of those tickets. It's assigned seating in pods for the health and safety. Again, very similar to what you would see at an Orioles game. Um, and yes, you do have to wear a mask. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind everybody to ask a question here as we get to the last 15 minutes. Use the Q&A function on your screen. Um, there's a question in, in regards to the overall status of the university's budget. Um, there have been some meetings that generally would provide some updates on the budget that, uh, that have been postponed or delayed. Um, could you provide just the general status of the university's budget? Uh, I will go to uh, President Schatzel and possibly then to uh, Vice President Lowenthal to provide some updates on where we stand fiscally. Um, I, I can just give some overview and then Ben, I, I'm going to ask you to fill in more detail there. Um, the capital budget, as we talked about, has been approved. And with that, uh, we received the funding to begin the construction of the College of Health Professions. When it comes to our operating budget, I want to remind everybody the fact that we received about a $9 million cut, as did about 10% of the USM's budget was cut last year, and our percentage of it was about $9 million. Uh, but we were able to claw back uh, a little over $4 million uh, in the supplementary budget that was issued, but that's, uh, that's designated into uh, the College of Health Professions and it's very specific to certain areas, but we're very grateful uh, to the legislature and the governor for their support there, as well as the regions. Um, we're, uh, we're awaiting uh, decisions on tuition and fees, which of course will have great impact on, uh, on us fiscally uh, for the next uh, academic year. Uh, we should learn about those fairly shortly, uh, and that will and that indeed have a great impact. Uh, as I announced when we had the last town hall, um, we do not have a pandemic freeze anymore with, we're good, with regard to hiring, but uh, I caution the fact that we have received a, a, a decrease in terms of our, uh, our budget from the state. Uh, we are uh, down from last year when it comes to enrollment by about three and a half percent. And I'm expecting that to shift over time with the great work of the faculty and the staff uh, uh, working in terms of, of having the students return. And if you take a look nationally, um, we're, we're outperforming in terms of the national numbers on those. So I'm very, very optimistic, but there, but there is a, an impact on that. And we've lost this fiscal year about $70 million because of the fact that we were de-densified and we didn't have the number of students in housing and we didn't have, uh, we had to be able to do refunds associated with those as well. So we're, we are returning to normal in terms of our budget. 
Um, but it's going to take a while for us to be able to do that. So uh, prudent spending is important. Uh, we don't have the freeze as we had before, but we do have to be able to take a look at our spending and take a look at our hiring, given this new normal of the fact that we have uh, these losses that we have to be able to address in terms of reserves, as well as the decrease from the state. Um, people have asked, and I'll ask Ben to really uh, add here, is what about the, the, the relief monies that are coming from the state and from uh, the federal government? And I know that he'll be more specific than I will be, but I can tell you the fact that those are, those are related to one-time uh, situations. And the vast majority of that we're using to be able to support the students. And that is required by the act themselves. So the fact that we are um, uh, providing financial aid to our students to be able to support them in terms of our return of their return to campus. But Ben, please fill in. I know you have a lot more detail than I do on this. So please, please offer that. Thank you, President Satzel. That was an excellent summary. In terms of the HERF dollar specifically, yes, there have been three different distributions, if you will, of HERF money, which is very much appreciated. But as President Sassel pointed out, there are the one-time monies, most of which have been used to address our students and their financial aid to work with them through the difficult financial situation of the last 14 months or so. The remaining money is primarily being addressed because it's one-time only to close the gap with that $76 million or so of losses that the president mentioned. And so that's where those dollars are actually uh, being pretty much being applied. So going forward, because of the cuts in the state budget and the uncertainty right now in terms of the increase that we've requested for tuition fees, which will be addressed uh, shortly today, actually, and as well as the enrollment, which is a continuing something that we monitor we are creating different scenarios to ensure that we can move forward with the balanced budget. And so those scenarios will impact our decisions as far as how much more can we continue to um, hire. As the president mentioned, we're gonna be reviewing all of those requests as well as, for example, and I think I saw a question in the Q&A related to travel and domestic travel is something that we will allow, but again, we allow it to, if, as long as the budget supports it. it, it we're still in a situation where we don't have a budget that we have pre-pandemic, and it is going to take us a while to get back to those levels. We certainly hope, and I'm optimistic as well, that we will. But for right now, we just need to be cautious and conservative to ensure that we have the, the budget balanced on a university wide basis. Thank you. Uh, this one coming in is not so much a question, but as they put it, a uh, a, a comment that needed to be said. Thank you for all you've done to keep us safe. Very simple, um, but very poignant remark. Um, with the uh, directional signs being removed, are entrances and exits to buildings easing restrictions? Are we, are we changing the restrictions on the entrances and exits to the actual buildings themselves? Uh, Vice President Lowenthal, if you could begin with that one. Yeah, the simple answer to that is yes. There are uh, a few buildings across campus that have some security needs wherein there might be a need to swipe to get in, but there won't be a directional requirement where you cannot get it. And so those will be addressed uh, as, as needed, but in general, all of those directional signs restricting entry or exit in certain doors will be removed. Thank you. Uh, we're in the last 10 minutes of our allotted time here. We do have a number of questions that we're going to uh, take down and try to put um, in FAQs on the website in the coming days. I do want to remind anybody who uh, comes up with a question after the fact or who feels their question needs uh, a follow-up to send us a message at asktu at towson.edu and updates will be provided at towson.edu slash coronavirus. Um, some additional questions that we'll try to get through here um, as we start to wrap things up. Um, in particular for our international students uh, or those who have lived or traveled abroad, what are the vaccination requirements for those individuals? Uh, those students who are either living internationally right now, maybe they went home amid the pandemic or who have traveled abroad, um, what are the vaccination requirements for them? Uh, and uh, I'll go to Vice President Hurt on this one to provide some details in regards to the specific vaccines. Sure, thanks, Sean. So uh, it'd be the same uh, requirement, the USM 
uh, a vaccine requirement does uh, mandate US uh, vaccination. So uh, for our international students um, who are abroad uh, and will be uh, here in the fall, uh, we'll be required to have uh, one of the US uh, approved vaccinations. Thank you. Um, a question in, in regards to volunteers for commencement. Uh, is there any information for those of us volunteering for commencement? Do we need to be tested or show proof of vaccination prior to the commencement ceremony? Provost Perot, I'll go to you for this one. So there's no uh, additional uh, testing or proof of vaccination that's required for volunteering for commencement. Um, if you, we just ask, of course, as any other person who uh, might be subject to sentinel testing that if your name gets called for sentinel testing, you do, of course, go get that test, but there's no additional requirement to volunteer. Thank you. Um, another facilities and construction question in, uh, so we'll go back to Vice President Lowenthal on this one. Can you provide an update on the status of campus construction projects, specifically um, the union, as well as the science complex? Um, is, is work complete on the science complex and will the trailers and construction uh, equipment around that facility be leaving here soon? Thank you, John, and I appreciate the question. So the work on the science complex is, for the most part, complete. However, as you recognize, the trailers are still there. There's a few changes that we're making to some of the more complex labs and lab equipment in that building. And the intent is for all of that to be done by the fall so that everyone can move into the building and the trailers should go away during the summer so that once the work is complete the, the trailers will be gone we'll be able to reseed and we'll make that lawn look the way it should uh, as, as it is uh, facing New York Road. As far as the union is concerned the, the phase one of that construction will be done this summer and that is encompasses pretty much 90 percent of the total renovation and addition on the union. There's a phase two that will continue throughout the following year and will be uh, open and ready to go in July of 22. So most of the union will be open for business this summer, this fall. It, that will include the, the new food court and, and many offices for our student services as well. What it will not include is uh, the theater and just so that we can note here too, I think there's another question we can address. Pause will continue to be closed throughout the next year so that that additional construction can be completed. Otherwise, all other food venues will be open. And as I stated, the new venue, which is a beautiful venue in the union will be open for the fall. Thank you. And there is one follow-up question in that just came in in regards to the, the new building that some departments will be moving to. I'm assuming they mean 401 Washington in Uptown Towson. Um, I'll go back to you on that one as well, Vice President Lowenthal. Yes, we are starting to move uh, some folks into 401 Washington beginning this month and stretching through the summer. We will then have almost, uh, I would say about 80% of that building occupied. It's a little work that needs to be done on the roof, so the top floor is not going to be occupied. Uh, and the first floor is, is currently occupied by other vendors. Uh, most of those vendors that were occupying the rest of the building have already been moved out, and we will be occupying, like I said, about 80 to 90 percent of that total building. We're also very excited about the Armory project in Uptown. That is scheduled to be completed this summer as well, and we will have uh, SPAR in the entrepreneurial program, SPAR moving into 401, entrepreneurial program moving into the Armory startup. And that is a very beautiful facility. Um, and I look forward to having it open to the campus community. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to squeeze two questions together here for our last one. And both of them are gonna ask all of us to uh, provide some insight into what we've learned through the pandemic. Um, first from a faculty member, uh, and this one goes deep. What have you as university administrators learned about our community that you didn't know from this pandemic? Um, specifically perhaps around how or why you value this educational community. That's a deep one. Thank you faculty for that one. And then um, to, to kind of add an additional um, angle to this is how do we see the university having changed um, as an institution coming out of uh, the pandemic? Um, does anybody want to jump first? <laughs> I'm happy to jump in there um, because really my my perspective on Towson University was uh, set by the, the pandemic. And, and one of the, the things that I'm very appreciative of is, you know, as a candidate for this position, 
um, it was clear that you know the community was um, really committed to TU and was hardworking. Um, but being introduced to Towson University in the midst of the pandemic really proved that. And so um, I, I've just been really fortunate and, and certainly gonna shout out uh, my Division of Student Affairs because uh, it's just been incredible at the student-centered focus um, that has maintained from, from day one. And so uh, this has kind of reiterated my gratitude for being at Towson University. I'll go, I'll go ahead and jump in second, if I may. And I just think it, um, to some extent, it confirmed some things that we, we already knew or strongly suspected, which of course is the, the care that we all have for each other, uh, the, the importance of, the, really the importance of what we're doing here as an institution, that this isn't just about creating widgets, right? It's about education. It's about our anchor institution mission. It's about being a positive force for the public good. That's what Towson University has always been about. And under the most challenging circumstances that anybody can imagine or beyond what uh, anybody imagined, we rose to the occasion. And that's everybody who's out in the, this audience right now, faculty, staff, students. Everybody took uh, initiative, everybody was creative, all in service of following this mission. And that's not to be taken lightly. This is an important mission and we did extra extraordinarily well under trying circumstances. And I'm just super, super appreciative of being part of this community. And I know that's that's true for everybody here. And did you bravo, bravo, um, bravo, bravo. Uh, I don't know, Steve, you wanna go? <laughs> yeah, one, one comment I'd make is that, uh, you know, it's often said that difficult times uh, build character, but I think difficult times showed our character as an institution, uh, collectively and individually. The amount of flexibility and resiliency that we've shown as an institution is is commendable, and no one can ever predict how how an institution is going to react in a time when you know it's an unpredictable situation. And uh, I just have to say and echo what what was said by the provost: the care and concern that individuals showed for each other, as well as for the campus community, uh, is is matched by none. And speaking to my colleagues and peers across the region and, and the country, we're in a special place, and uh, I appreciate being a part of that. Thank you, Steve. And I, I'm going to repeat somewhat, but I, I just thought that there were three words that came to mind in terms of what we've accomplished over the last year to me. It was resilience, which has already been used, uh, committed, and collaborative. And I just want to say that all that has been accomplished under these incredible circumstances could not have happened without the collaboration of my colleagues here on the call, more so, I think, the entire staff that really made everything happen. So I'll mention AF staff specifically, but I would go beyond that and say the collaboration across areas and divisions, without that, we could not have accomplished what we have. It's just super impressive, and I too are I'm very happy to be here. It's a testament to the community. Yeah, I, right. uh, you know, I echo everything that my colleagues have said, and I probably can't uh, can say it in, in a more elegant or in a more eloquent way. Um, you know, the things that have been pointed out were the fact that we were so supportive of each other and so flexible. We asked people to do things and to compromise uh, and to be able to be flexible. Um, and, and everybody did it as quickly as they could with absolutely no hesitation in terms of being able to support each other. Uh, I knew that about this campus. I also knew this campus's commitment to the community and that came out in, in spades. Um, I, I've also watched the commitment to the, the, of the faculty towards the students to try and keep a, a sense of normalcy in their classrooms with the students and to go, go out the extra mile and, and the extra 10 miles to stay in contact with their students and to be able to support their success when the students have, uh, ha, have had struggles to be able to do that. So the commitment to our students and student success came through loud and clear. Um, you know, for the last month or so, I've, I've taken every opportunity to be able to attend virtually um, the College of Fine Arts end of, end of semester, end of year events, uh, everything from senior dance to, to Tiny Houses concert to the, to the TU chorus performance this past weekend. Um, it's extraordinary. 
to be able to see our students uh, with their faculty, to be able to, to do things that we did last year in a way that we never would have imagined. Uh, but the joy that the students show and the joy that the faculty and the commitment they show, I, I think speaks to what we are a, as a university. And I know it's across the university. It's not just uh, in the College of Fine Arts. Um, it also told me why I also, in all honesty, feel I have the best job in the world. Um, I mean, to be able to be a part of students' lives and to be able to work with them in such a transformational part of their lives is a blessing. Uh, and to be able to work with this campus community during this most trying time is also a blessing to me as a, as a president. Um, but I can tell you, I miss the students. Uh, you know, now that I can see them more, the band was playing last weekend when I was driving past, I pulled up United's Drive, got out, and they were all, you know, socially distanced playing, but I had a chance to be able to talk to them all, and it, they were so excited to be with each other, and I was so excited to be able to see them, and I can't wait for that to return this fall, that we can all come back to this campus and once again be together. Normally here is where I would give some closing remarks for the president, but I feel like the entire panel may have just given some closing remarks. Um, I will give you an opportunity to, uh, to wrap things up, President Schatzel, in a moment. I do want to thank all of the um, participants who asked questions. We had over 200 come in today. I think that might be a new record for questions. Uh, we're going to do our best to get those we did not answer on the call here um, updated on the university website. For any that we did not uh, get to and you do not see information on the university website, please email asktu, that's asktu at towson.edu, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can uh, with answers to your questions. Um, towson.edu slash coronavirus for more information, including a recording of this town hall later this week. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, special thank you to Barb. Um, for providing uh, interpretation for all of our uh, participants today. And I'll hand things over to President Schassel for anything else she'd like to say here at the end. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for doing a great job moderating once again. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Know what it must be like to have all those questions coming to be able to sort through. You did a great job. Um, you know, once again, I just want to thank everybody for everything they've done to support our students and, and each other. I, I cannot say it enough. So I take every opportunity to do that. I look forward to seeing many of you at commencement and to be able to celebrate our students and their families in this important milestone as they become uh, Towson University graduates, something they've been working hard for throughout their entire lives to be able to reach that moment. Um, you know, I want to be able to also say the fact that um, we will have more town halls through the summertime to be able to keep people informed as uh, particularly as status changes and uh, when we learn more about uh, what might be changing on campus or what those requirements might be. So please understand the fact that we will stay close and we will communicate um, um, as much as we possibly can to make sure that our campus is fully informed. And lastly, I want to just everybody to please roll up your sleeves and get the vaccine as a tiger. The most important thing that we can do to support this campus and to support our students and each other is to be able to get vaccinated this fall. Again, of course, you have concerns about it, either medically or religiously, please talk to your doctor. Please look at the information on the website. Uh, but I want to make sure that I encourage everybody to roll up your sleeves uh, and to be able to support the fact that we have a safe and healthy campus this fall. And thank you again. I look forward to seeing many of you at commencement.